Welcome to our Ask the Expert series for adults living with hydrocephalus and normal pressure hydrocephalus. I am so happy to be here today at Johns Hopkins Hospital with Dr. Abe Mogakar, a neurologist, and Dr. Mark Luciano, a neurosurgeon, and they are both with the Cerebrofluid Center for CSF Disorders. So in this segment, what I'd like to focus on is treatment. And actually, what for individuals, I'd like to look at individuals who are not candidates for treatment for normal pressure hydrocephalus. This does come up a lot at the association. People call us and they say, my loved one has been told they're not a candidate for treatment. What can we expect? So can we talk a little bit about uh, individuals who are faced with that um, explanation? So there's uh, some research that shows that if someone is not treated, has hydrocephalus for months to years, there may be progression in their problems with walking, their cognition. We don't have enough natural history studies that tell us accurately what happens over several years or the lifespan of these individuals. What we do know is that they do face increasing disability. But at an individual level, it's difficult to predict because there are some people who can go years like five years, seven years, and may not show much progression. On the other hand, we have patients who have progressed over a year. So Dr. Megokar, there are two circumstances. There are the individuals who are not candidates for treatment, and that would have been determined from some of the initial diagnostic tests where fluid was withdrawn, and it, did, it showed that there would not be significant improvement if they had a shunt removing fluid all the time. Um, but then there are also people who, I mean, let's face it, this is brain surgery right, Dr. Luciano, and this is terrifying for somebody potentially in their late 70s who is looking at having brain surgery for the first time, um, and they refuse to seek treatment. And so I'm assuming the prognosis, you know, they would then need to be prepared for deterioration, particularly in their physical abilities, but also in their cognitive abilities too, memory, decision-making capabilities. Um, and then, Dr. Lucian, I feel like you were going to say something, so I don't want to interrupt you. No, I, it was just to reinforce what Dr. Mogukar was saying, in that uh, it's, a, it's a, an important moment in our treatment of this patient. When they come in, they have to be prepared for a positive test, meaning, yes, fluid removal helps, and we're, we're going to recommend a shunt. But they also have to know, and the family has to know, that there may be no improvement that's seen. And then what is that step? I mean, the people who have other problems, because they come to us, They've been told, you have hydrocephalus, many of them. Uh, you have big ventricles. And, and many adults, many people do have enlarged ventricles. So they come to us with great hopes of, yes, I have hydrocephalus. You're doing this little test, but then I'm going to you know, get my surgical treatment. And this is why we do the test. Some people will not improve with the shunt. And we have to know that before uh, you know, we as neurosurgeons go ahead and, and do a brain operation, put a catheter into the brain, and, and drain. So we do find ourselves in a situation where we go to the patient saying, I know you, you, know, you have big ventricles and we believe you might have hydrocephalus, but, but you don't have the hydrocephalus that will improve with shunting. We've shown that by the trial. So these patients are, well, some of them are very happy. They say, oh, I don't have the problem. I don't need the surgery. But many of them obviously hoped a great deal that they had this. Where do they go from there? We have to send them back to their general physician back to a neurologist who then looks at other causes and perhaps a geriatrician. Uh, very often there's aspects of polypharmacy, taking a lot of medications. There's a lot of other neurological reasons for, for cognitive deterioration, vascular dementia. So there are many other options that have to be explored. So our goal in this decision-making process is to say, will, will shunting help? But when it doesn't, and we have to tell them, you know, they have to understand that there may be other avenues open and other physicians that may be able to help uh, at least uh, help the symptoms. So they come back to you, Dr. Mogakar, and what is your plan with them? And how do, you, how do you work with those families? So in patients who are determined not to be candidates for shunting, there must be some other explanation for why they have cognitive problems or balance problems. And it is our role and the responsibility to figure out what, and that's what our attention focuses on then. Going back to an earlier part of your question, I would say that age should not be a qualifier or a disqualifier for shunt surgery. We've had patients in their 90s, 
get shunts and do better. We have a patient who got a shunt when she was 92 and she celebrated her 101st birthday. Wow. So being old shouldn't be the criterion by which you, uh, the decision for surgery should be determined. Uh, yeah, uh, age itself is never uh, the criteria. We, I've had to say we can't operate on a patient who's in their you know, late 60s and early 70s for obvious other reasons, whether it be cardiac or diabetes or, or other vascular issues. Uh, a, a healthy 80 or, or 90 year old patient plus uh, is certainly a candidate. It is, a, it is an operation and it is in what we think is one of the most important organs of the, of the brain, but uh, the, the surgery itself involves smaller incisions than many other operations it is actually not as painful uh, to go through as a knee operation, as a knee replacement, where there's a lot of work to do with, with, with uh, you know, physical therapy and so forth afterwards. Uh, so in terms of the amount of stress of the surgery itself, uh, when it all goes the way we plan, it is not that much of a stressor. And I don't mean to belittle it. It is a catheter that goes to the brain. Uh, and so we, of course, screen carefully. But uh, a 90-year-old can go through the surgery. So just to wrap up the question, it sounds like for individuals who have been uh, decided to not be candidates for treatment, it really is then going back to the neurology team, starting to look at what other causes might be underlying some of the decline that's being seen, as well as looking at quality of life and helping advise on quality of life, helping somebody maintain their quality of life as long as possible as, their other, um, as you're looking at other possibilities. So I would assume that that would also then entail, as Dr. Luciano would mention, referrals to like physical therapists, uh, occupational therapists, things like that. Um, for the individuals who refuse treatment, what would you say to them? Who are candidates and who are healthy particularly? Mm -hmm. Well, I think we start off talking a little bit about the natural history of, of NPH. So this would be, that's, this is a category of patients that we think may indeed have NPH and an element of hydrocephalus, and we might have been able to help them uh, with surgery, but they refuse. And first of all, we all acknowledge that surgery is something that sh should certainly be thought of very carefully and can very uh, uh, correctly be refused in a patient who doesn't want to have it. Uh, and so we do see patients say, well, no, I won't have the operation. I will say that some of them say it, uh, but when they feel the beneficial effects after the CSF trial, it, many of them change their mind because they like that, that improvement. When you've withdrawn fluid. Yes, yes. Right. So I say, you may not want to have surgery, we understand, but let's take off some fluid and see how you do, and then we could talk from there. But there are patients who, uh, who then still do not want to have treatment for one reason or another. What do we know about the natural history? As Dr. Mogukar said, not too much. We do know there are some studies which looked like over a course of a half a year or so that says that there is often deterioration over that kind of time span. When we look at the patients that we see and evaluate, we see some that deteriorate over a year. We see some that go five, eight years and gradually change. So there, there's no spontaneous improvement that, we, that I've seen. But there can be a, quite a, a variability in the slope of, of a deterioration. Okay. Well, thank you both very much. For those of you who are facing this decision about uh, how to manage your hydrocephalus if you're not able to seek treatment or who have decided to not treat your hydrocephalus, um, it sounds like the the advice here is that you will go back to a neurologist and so work very closely with your neurology team to help figure out what some other underlying uh, conditions might be that might be causing decline as well as um, take advantage of the different referrals to maintain your quality of life as long as possible. So I'd like to thank Dr. Mogukar and Dr. Luciano for joining us today. Thank all of you for submitting questions for our Ask the Expert series and we'll see you next time.